Welcome to the Grand Theft World podcast, sponsored by the members of GrandTheftWorld.com. We got an action-packed show for you tonight. We're going to be here for the next six or seven hours, taking the week's events, smashing them into this little contextual history, digging into uh, a little bit more than the, just the, just the superficial that you get out there. We're going to have some in-depth analysis on some of the things going on. Big topics in this week in Grand Theft World news, such as Elon Musk. Ukraine told him to F off last week. So this week he did. He pulled Starlink from Ukraine, Blackjack, all the satellites that were enabling them to fight the Russians. So there's kind of a standoff there. So while he's battling Twitter on one side, he's got uh, Zelensky and the people who told him to F off on the other. In Ukraine's fight to push out Russian invaders, one of the most critical pieces of technology doesn't fire rockets or bullets. It's small, easy to use satellite internet terminals called Starlink made by SpaceX, the rocket and satellite company founded by Elon Musk. According to SpaceX, there are around 20,000 Starlink terminals in Ukraine, and they've been vital for soldiers' communication, flying drones, and artillery targeting. Starlink is the glue, really, between the forward-deployed drone and the artillery that's conducting uh, uh, the strike against Russian positions. Starlink arrived in Ukraine as the war started, earning Musk global praise and thanks. CNN has now exclusively obtained documents showing not only that SpaceX is just one part of a large international effort getting Starlink to Ukraine's front lines, but now, seven months into the war, SpaceX is warning the Pentagon it is facing the difficult choice of reducing or stopping service. This just into CNN, Elon Musk is responding to an exclusive CNN report that his company SpaceX says it can no longer pay for critical satellite services in Ukraine and is asking the Pentagon to pick up the tab. CNN's Alex Marquardt joins me now on the phone. Alex, uh, what is Elon Musk uh, saying now? Well, Jim, if, if what he's saying in his tweet is true, then this is a, a complete reversal of what his company has been paying, uh, t- telling the Pentagon. Um, it's, of course, hard to tell how, how serious he's being in, in his tweet today. He's saying, to hell with it. We will keep funding uh, Starlink in Ukraine, uh, despite the fact that they are still losing money. And then one of the big stories this week, not a lot of people heard about it. It's a billion dollar lawsuit. I know what you're thinking. It's not that story. It's a billion dollar lawsuit against Eco Health Alliance, Peter Daszak, the people who probably brought you the lab created concoction, which then needed a lab edited antidote. So uh, attorney Thomas Renz, he filed a lawsuit on behalf of I think it's going to be a class action lawsuit. So if you know somebody who was uh, injured by that uh, pandemic situation, you might check into the lawsuit. They're asking for at least a billion dollars, but I think it's a good start. We just filed a billion dollar lawsuit against EcoHealth Alliance and several others for the creation of SARS-CoV-2 in the lab in Wuhan, China with the Chinese, okay? So we've alleged that they've created it there. We believe we can prove it in court and we're gonna, we're gonna show it. I think we're gonna win this. We've got a firsthand whistleblower. We got all these different things. This is the greatest conspiracy ever unleashed on mankind. Six and a half million dead by their numbers, right? They kill six and a half million dead. You've seen, the, you've seen all sorts of distractions coming up to the election, coming up to all this. You know, we file, we file the, one of the biggest lawsuits in history on this sort of thing. All of a sudden, we've got some major talk of some war stuff. We got some, oh. No, 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 no. sir, I'm listening to you, go ahead. Oh, okay. So we got some major talks of some war stuff. We got some major talks of some chaos of all this stuff going on. So the question I would ask is given that we we put this lawsuit out there and given that we just released a report that tied this to Hunter Biden, that tied this to the U.S. intelligence community, that tied this to the military industrial complex, isn't it convenient that with all these ties to all of these people that suddenly we're talking about a war? Now, on the other hand, there was another lawsuit type situation this past week that got decided and it was a billion dollar fine. One billion dollars fined to Mr. Alex Jones. And then uh, the tweet, the Twitterverse was uh, just popping off everywhere, comparing everyone from OJ Simpson 
to Ford Motor Cars. Ford Motor Cars, once upon a time, set some people on fire, and it was only $3 million. Alex Jones, what did he do? What calamity, what genocide was he responsible for in order to be uh, held to a billion-dollar judgment? So Alex Jones has been ordered to pay 965 million US dollars for the false claims he made about the Sandy Hook massacre. Yeah, that's right. 965 million dollars. I mean, at this point, they might as well have just said, you owe us one million kajillion dollars. To put into perspective just how insane this is, I'm gonna tell you a little story about the 1981 Grimshaw versus Ford case. In the 1970s, Ford created an inexpensive compact car called the Pinto. To cut down on manufacturing costs, they placed the gas tank behind the rear axle instead of above which was the more common placement for safety purposes. After conducting crash tests on the new vehicle, it was discovered that the placement of the gas tank did indeed pose a very serious safety risk. When the gas tank was ruptured in a rear end collision, it caused the car to burst into flames. While the cost to change the placement of the gas tank was a mere $15.30 per car, Ford crunched the numbers and came to the conclusion that it would be cheaper to absorb the cost of any future lawsuits than to fix the issue. Of course, after the car was rolled out to the public, the inevitable happened. A Pinto in Orange County, California was rear-ended and burst into flames, killing driver Lily Gray and severely disfiguring her passenger, Richard Grimshaw. Lily's family and Grimshaw filed separate lawsuits and the jury awarded them $127.8 million in damages. The judge later reduced that award to a mere $3.5 million. $3.5 million for intentionally setting a woman and her passenger on fire. So what does this all mean? It means by the standard of the American legal system, Alex Jones could have saved $909 million by killing all 32 of the Sandy Hook victims himself rather than suggesting the massacre never happened. There was a, a co there was like a, a viral clip going around this week from an EU member of parliament from the Netherlands. And during the meeting where they were questioning not Albert Borla because he wasn't sick with COVID for the third time, he just didn't show up to the meetings. So he put somebody in his place and that woman on the panel let uh, the, the gentleman from the Netherlands know that, oh yeah, there was no testing on whether or not it stopped transmission. And she said it in a very blase and, you know, kind of matter of fact, because it was known on her side, but to the EU parliament, it was a big surprise. In a COVID hearing in the European Parliament, one of the Pfizer directors just admitted to me, at the time of introduction, the vaccine had never been tested on stopping the transmission of the virus. This removes the entire legal basis for the COVID passport. The COVID passport that led to massive institutional discrimination as people lost access to essential parts of society. I find this to be shocking, even criminal. Please watch the video until the end. Voor u, mevrouw Small, heb ik de volgende vraag waar ik een duidelijk antwoord op wil. And I will speak in English so there are no misunderstandings. Was the Pfizer COVID vaccine tested on stopping the transmission of the virus before it entered the market? If not, please Say it clearly. If yes, are you willing to share the data with this committee? And I really want a straight answer, yes or no, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Um, regarding the question around, um, did we know about stopping humanization before um, it entered the market? No. Uh, these, um, you know, we had to really move at the speed of science to really understand what is taking place in the market. This is scandalous. Millions of people worldwide felt forced to get vaccinated because of the myth that you do it for others. Now this turned out to be a cheap lie. We are bringing the facts, the facts, not misinformation, the facts. Everyone who takes the vaccine is not just protecting themselves, but reducing their transmission. The vaccine's fucking amazing. 
And it also saved Phineas from getting it, saved my parents from getting it. These vaccines will protect you and those you love from this dangerous and deadly disease. The people who choose not to get vaccinated. If you get vaccinated, your chance of ever spreading the infection to somebody else just drops off a cliff. Don't get to get on a plane. Elmo getting vaccinated is the best way to keep himself, our friends, neighbors, and everyone else healthy. We're trained. You're not going to get COVID if you have these vaccinations. Don't get to go to movie theaters. Essentially, vaccines block you from getting and giving um, the virus. For gyms. To block the kind of exponential growth. Don't get to work in the public service uh, or restaurants and other non-essential services. Vaccinated people do not carry the virus. The data are striking, Savannah. They're really quite impressive. Don't get sick. And the more people who get them, the better we're going to be able to help stop the spread of COVID. Plus, the Pfizer COVID vaccine tested on stopping the transmission of the virus before it entered the market. And I really want a straight answer. We need to get used to being vaccinated with COVID vaccines for the future. The virus stops with every vaccinated person. He made them come up with a vaccine. That is from God to us. And we must say thank you, God. Uh, with vaccines that God gave the scientists an opportunity to figure out how this works. Everybody's measuring anybody's. They're probably relevant. But as we know, that's uh, a long question. We need a quick answer. <laughs> the level of virus in the nasopharynx of a person who's vaccinated and infected is the same level as the level of virus in the nasopharynx of an unvaccinated person. Right. That's the reason why we ask you to wear a mask after you've been vaccinated, but... Obviously, we don't have a complete understanding of the nature of the way that the vaccine works in terms of producing immune response. We're never going to learn about how safe the vaccine is unless you start giving it. Um, regarding the question around, um, did we know about stopping humanization before um, it entered the market? No. I would say there is no established correlate of protection. Uh, these, um, you know, we had to really move at the speed of science to really understand what is taking place in the market. Thank you. That was a quick answer. And then from that clip, I went back and watched the whole meeting. There's a whole bunch of other interesting clips in there that nobody's looked at. We're going to look at some of those. Last but not least, my colleague, Christine Anderson from Germany. Yes, hello. Good morning from me too. So, yesterday's session of COVID committee showed yet again that EU Parliament is nothing but a gigantic <laughs> show of democracy illusion to fool the peoples of Europe into thinking their interests were represented in Parliament. It is not, though. Not only do the invited panelists, such as representatives of pharmaceutical companies or ministers of health from the member states, not answer any of our questions. No, they continue to spread disinformation about the safety and efficacy of mRNA injections. They continue to lie about and downplay, outright deny the uh, harmful effects of these injections. They continue to keep, uh, they continue to uh, keep to deny the people access to the contracts and they continue to let Ursula von der Leyen get away with not disclosing the texts exchanged between her and Pfizer CEO, Mr. Borla. In short, they continue to demonstrate their utter contempt for the peoples of EU. The chair of COVID committee, Ms. Kathleen van Bremt, social democrat in Belgium, does not run this committee to serve the people. She runs this committee to protect the interests of pharmaceutical companies, EU Commission and governments of EU at the expense of the people. Yesterday, Mrs. van Bremt refused to put a point of order to a vote. This is a gross violation of the rules of procedure and demonstrates her disregard for democracy and the rights of the people. You might want to drop her a couple of lines to let her know that you will not tolerate your rights being violated by her or anyone else for that matter.
I had raised this point of order to declare COVID committee incompetent to serve the best interest of the people and to expose their scheme for lack of authority to compel anyone to appear in front of committee and to answer any questions, thus opening a way to have a formal committee of inquiry set up. A formal committee of inquiry would give the people the means to get to the bottom of things and would put an end to their plot of stripping the people of freedom, democracy and the rule of law. All of us here today and many more, there is more MEPs by now, we will continue to fight for a committee of inquiry, but we need you to join us in this fight. We need your help to do it. So here's what you can do. Write to your MEPs, call their offices, and keep doing it. I mean, do it over and over and over again, literally clocking their phone lines. Get on their nerves. Demand a committee of inquiry. And keep doing it for as long as it takes. Do not stop until your demands are met. It is your right. Let them know that in a democracy, it is in fact you, the people that are running the show. And if they fail to respect that, then let them know you will replace them. So please take charge, get involved. Don't let these anti-democrats get away with stripping you of your freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. Thank you. Also. Pelosi on January 6th conveniently had a uh, film crew with her all, all day. Coincidentally, it happened to be her daughter, who's a very fine filmmaker in her, her own right. And Pelosi has some quotes that seem to foreshadow what was going to happen that day, almost as if it was expected or wanted or desired or was like the crescendo of a career. So we will check into that story. Did they think this would be good for them? I'm shocked to see this. CNN published a clip from a documentary filmed by Nancy Pelosi's own daughter of her admitting, quote, I've been waiting for this on January 6th and then saying she's going to physically attack the president and go to jail. They believed that this would be good for them. Secret Service said they have dissuaded him from coming to Capitol Hill. They told him they don't have the resources to protect him here. So at the moment, he is not coming, but that could change. change. Oh, he comes, I'm going to punch him out. This oh, is my no, mom. I would pay to see I'm that. waiting for this, for trespassing on the Capitol grounds. I'm going to punch him out, and I'm going to go to jail, and I'm going to be happy. Hold on there a minute, my friends. Why was Nancy Pelosi filming? Why did Nancy Pelosi have a film crew on her on January 6th? Nobody knew this was going to happen. No one knew. Or did they? What? Why was why was Nancy Pelosi's daughter filming inside on this day? OK, fair point. Maybe it's because it was just a historic moment. It was a historic moment. Really? OK, I guess. I guess. I just find it very strange that you have all of these things lining up together. Nancy Pelosi's daughter filming her. Nancy Pelosi saying, quote, I have been waiting for this, for trespassing on the Capitol grounds. That's a quote. And then her threatening to physically attack the president. Sounds to me like, uh, here's what I think. I think they knew something was going to happen. I don't think they knew exactly what. I think there's questions about why the police were opening the doors. And now it's all coming together, isn't it? And then special guest tonight, part two with Whitney Webb on her book, One Nation Under Blackmail. We get to the really juicy, substantial parts of the whole Epstein saga. But Lynn Forrester was, um, I think Andrew Stein was trying to be a politician in New York at the time and failed to get elected. And then she basically was like, you're not, you know, as, as you know, uh, she's a climber. Like, she knew she's a she climber. Could go I'm trying yeah. to say it nicely. So, yeah, that's probably the best way to uh, to put it. And so Epstein apparently stepped in in 92 or 93 or so the same year when his name uh, was dropped from the case of the Ponzi scheme at Towers Financial. 
Mm -hmm. And when he starts getting involved with the Clinton White House, uh, he steps in to help her financially. But apparently they knew each other before, uh, but it's not exactly clear how um, how they met. So, yeah. So for everyone playing at home, uh, Lynn Forster, later Lynn Forster to Rothschild, she in 2013 created this inclusive capitalism movement that had uh, one third of the the world's and. (laughs) <laughs> with the, well, the Pope came onto it later, later with COVID yeah. and the Great Reset because they had to rebrand it. Mm-hmm. It went nowhere when they did it in 2013. Mm-hmm. But she had Christine Lagarde introduce her in this meeting. And she says, we have one third of the world's investable wealth in one room and poverty is a problem and we rich people should take care of it. And it's basically like the, the prelude to the Great Reset. And yeah, it, so it's so the same people. The- Lynn Forrester's inclusive capital movement came at a time when she was really uh, closely associated with Deutsche Bank, which interestingly enough at the time was Epstein's bank of choice by that period. Um, And it also followed um, her creation of a, uh, I don't know if you call it an investment firm. I think it is. It was, it's called uh, or was called uh, Bronfman Rothschild LP. It's basically, you know, Lynn Forrester, what I think Matthew Bronfman, Uh, joining forces and then she goes and makes this inclusive capitalism whatever which is basically you know global stakeholder capitalism uh yeehaw fun time uh party group and deutsche bank also (laughs) i think was involved in some insider trading on 9-11 so i'm sure that's just coincidental yeah and also um one of the main 9-11 insider traders uh traders um buzzy krongard is one of the people involved with uh leon black and apollo global management and is the guy that uh wrote the report saying that leon black did nothing wrong in his relationship with jeffrey epstein so that's comforting yeah sarcasm. i like when they i like when they own up to and just say yeah what i did is what i did and i take ownership over it i mean it never it, it though never i will say me. that no one's really been interested in the details of what leon black said about his relationship with Epstein. And there's some very interesting things in there. For example, Leon Black says, the reason I got involved with Jeffrey Epstein and let him manage my fi- my family foundation is because David Rockefeller personally appointed Epstein to the board of Rockefeller University and thought the world of Epstein. And, and no one wants to talk about the Rockefeller relationship with Epstein. Or the yeah. trilateral commission membership, or any of that stuff. So, anyway, um, you know, I'll add, add it to the list of things mainstream media won't talk about when it comes to to Jeffrey Epstein, I guess. And uh, yeah, there's World War Three brewing, but uh, we'll we'll check into that later on tonight. We'll save it for later. Let's go to uh, the kickoff with Luke Bradowski from WeAreChange.org and TheBestPoliticalShirts.com and get uh, his summary from his Sunday report. Very important thing I told my daughter and granddaughters: no serious guys in your 30s. Okay. Right? No what? No serious guys in your 30s. Oh, keep that in mind. <laughs> what? Why in the world would you do that? And yeah, you do realize what he was named in his own son's phone as a f- official contact, right? What? <laughs> What makes autonomy uniquely empowering? Autonomy is a self-help course unlike any other. Over the course of our 12-week program, you'll experience weekly live lectures from Richard Grove, specifically designed to equip you with the skills you need to set yourself free. Free from the learned helplessness taught in our schools, free from the dependence on a corrupt system that serves only to uphold the rich, free from the structure of your nine to five if that's your prerogative. Plus, you'll enter into a community of like-minded individuals who are pursuing the same freedom you are and who'll support you and learn alongside you every step of the way. A lifetime of community and the tools to live however you want. We can't wait to meet you. Learn more at getautonomy.info. (laughs) 